All right, we got one more guest, one more segment here for this Wednesday edition of Bang the Book Radio. That is with Wes Reynolds, at Wes Reynolds, the number one on Twitter, host on VEASAN and contributor to the Point Spread Weekly Newsletter. Wes, how's it going today, man? Adam, doing well, sir. How are you? Doing very well, buddy. Appreciate your time, as always, here. And uh, I know you know the high-volume lifestyle. You've always been a higher-volume handicapper since you moved to Vegas, doing more stuff from a content standpoint. So, not as much betting on your end, but you know, for a lot of people, it's probably pretty daunting to add the NBA to the daily handicapping calendar. But uh, it's probably just uh, you know throwback to the same old for you. Yeah, it is. I mean, I'm I'm trying to be a little more careful as we go with the NBA season because look, uh, the pace looked like it was up in uh, a lot of the preseason games. So uh, you're a little bit gun shy, at least at this point, in terms about betting uh unders in terms of totals even though they went one and one last night but uh i mean a perfect example is a game i i didn't really i didn't bet but it's a spot i would usually play and that would be against on that ring and banner night against the defending champions and it was uh in play last night of course with new orleans and toronto now it was a tough beat but if you had new orleans plus seven you're pretty much winning and covering the whole game and then all of a sudden it goes to overtime, and you know how that is with the underdog. you got to win the game twice, and that's exactly what New Orleans had to do, and they fall short of covering the spread. And I thought even uh, even uh, with the news of Zion, and even when we thought Zion maybe was going to play before he was ruled out, that line was only like five and a half, and, and then it moved up to around seven with, with the news that Williamson wasn't going to go. And it almost felt like you were getting cheated in the line a little bit. Uh, I mean, because that spot would have been maybe eight and a half, nine, nine and a half a few years ago with with these two teams. And then, of course, Toronto gets downgraded because they no longer have Kawhi Leonard. So it was like it just felt like I mean, and I was questioning myself. I'm like, am I leaving off a winner here? And uh it became fortunate that I did not because did not end up playing the game. So really the first couple weeks, I'm going to be just looking for like little spots because we don't really have any, any data for these teams to go on. So that's kind of what I think you have to do. And there's nothing wrong when I talk to some other people that are even regular NBA betters, there's nothing wrong with maybe even sitting out a little bit or making just a rare spot play instead of, okay, we got a big card, so you got to be in action tonight. So, like, as of right now, I don't have any bets tonight for the NBA. I mean, I may have one later today uh, when I get to look at the card a little more and a little deeper. But, yeah, with these first couple weeks, I mean, you don't want to rush it. It's a long season. Yeah, it definitely is. It was kind of a mixed bag for me. I wrote a preview over at bangthebook.com about this game with some betting angles for side and total, some player prop stuff, too. I nailed Pascal Siakam in the big night that he had with 34 and 18, but Drew Holiday really struggled for the Pelicans. And of course, then they failed to cover the number of seven, which, uh, you know, a reminder that it definitely is NBA season with a bad beat there. But you mentioned the ring and banner night. And I think that, you know, it, it's very hard early on in the season with all the roster turnover, free agency. We got what I think eight new head coaches or something like that in the NBA this year it's a lot of stuff to try and figure out, especially when you've been fully focused on football. But man, when it comes to scheduling spots, there's nothing better than the NBA. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, the way that uh, they've obviously, I know they, because they're starting the season earlier now, they are uh, trying to eliminate so many back-to-backs and so many four and five nights, but eventually there's, there's going to be a few. So that's, I mean, those are the things you're re- you're really going to want to look at, or you get a team with a big win off well off one of the ESPN or the TNT or the ABC games, then usually either the game before, or the game after, uh, there's potentially some value on going to the other side. So that's kind of what I'm sticking with until I can get some real numbers here, or kind of look at some power ratings and see if I can uh, determine uh, who's uh, undervalued, who's overvalued. That's kind of what I've been doing with some uh, success with the NHL. The first week, I didn't I didn't exactly do great. And then ever since then, it's been a lot better because you get these teams that you thought were going to be good that were off to slow starts, and they end up uh, 
picking it up or maybe some of the teams that get out the hot starts and and then uh there are some spots that go against them it was kind of like that with the uh Edmonton Oilers and the Minnesota Wild last night you were looking at it and I mean on the surface you were saying well why are the Minnesota Wild favorites over the Edmonton Oilers Edmonton is seven and one they got a lot of young talent they finally seem like they're getting it together up there with all that young talent they've been accumulating through the draft and then they're against a wild team that had really struggled that finally got a win on Sunday and it's like okay why are the wild favorites and I ended up playing the wild and they end up shutting out the Oilers three to nothing. So you can see some spots there because uh, the way these teams are bet, uh, I mean, I don't, I didn't know very many people that were on the Minnesota wild, but it was like someone's on them apparently. And I'm going to go with the someone's. All right. So let's move over to the NFL here as we stay on the pro side, then we'll do some college football. And, and if we got some time left in the segment here, we'll do this new golf event over in Japan, but On the NFL side, a game that we didn't really talk too much about here on the show, largely because on the surface, it doesn't seem like that interesting of a game. Washington and Minnesota. And I did mention this, you know, the Thursday night game here this week. You do have Cousins against his old team, Keenum against his old team. So there are some kind of intriguing storylines, but the spread is 16 or 16 and a half here. Total up from 41 to 42 and a half. So big spread, total kind of in a range where it suggests that Washington may not score. And as we know, Washington didn't score at all last week. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting that we have kind of a rare angle this week. uh, uh, And we actually have a qualify with two different games. Uh, You don't see this very often. And this is when you get NFL teams off a shutout at home. And Washington Redskins are one of them. The New York Jets are the other. They're now taking around, I believe, six at Jacksonville, adjusted up off that Monday night performance where before they were like four and a half or somewhere around there. When you get NFL teams off a home shutout, and since 2009, uh, taking those teams that did get shut out are 15 and six against the spread. So 71% over the last 10 years. If you go back to 2000, I believe it's uh, 30 and 16 against the spread for 65 percent and that's the Washington Redskins and the New York Jets this week now the Jets I think because it seems to be a more competitive game you could probably stomach a little bit more uh, uh, against the Jacksonville Jaguars but yeah this is a tough spot I mean I, I would lean to Washington at this point just because that's such a big number but one thing I gotta say about Minnesota And that's why last week I was a little bit gun shy and I didn't really do much with the Minnesota Detroit game because I wasn't sure how much Minnesota was going to throw the football. And we saw or we we heard when uh, Adam Thielen and Stefan Diggs kind of put their name to it. And we're like, you know what, we need to throw the ball a little bit more and be a little bit more aggressive in the passing game. And then it turns out they were in those games against the Giants and against the Eagles. But you had to take into account that the Giants and the Eagles both have very weak pass defenses, and the Eagles are all kind of banged up in the secondary, which we saw in the Sunday night game at Dallas. But they went ahead and were still aggressive at Detroit. So I don't want to say this is a total philosophy and identity change because I don't believe it is because Minnesota is still running the ball quite a bit. I think Mike Zimmer, that's just his way. He always wants to have a real strong running game and play defense, but they are letting Cousins make a little bit more throws down the field, and they've hit a lot more big plays than we're used to seeing out of that passing game. So, uh, Minnesota, I do believe, has made at least a slight transition to try to be a little bit more balanced offensively. I mean, look, Dalvin Cook's still going to run the ball at least 25 times a game. But, uh, yeah, I mean you got to like what you're seeing a little bit out of Minnesota. I think this is a big number, though. So if I end up playing it, it's going to be the Redskins side, but uh, I'll be playing it holding my nose. Yeah, I I don't blame you for that. I mean, you know, Washington uh, also doing something that hasn't been done very often, covering a number while getting shut out. I mean, that's something that rarely happens in the NFL. Right. Fourth time since 1978 that that happens. So, I guess we'll kind of see, you know, I mean, I think this is an interesting game again, from a storyline standpoint, 
and the angle with the home team coming off of a shutout. But, you know, again, a tough game to take Washington. I think a very, I think here's the thing. I think you can make a case for Washington. I think it's a little bit tougher to make a case for Minnesota because, you know, they are coming off that division game on a short week and offensively. I mean, this is a team that's pretty good, but probably not as good as we've seen here of late. So you would expect a little bit of offensive regression coming from the Vikings here at some point. But moving on from that game, a game we talked about a little bit on the previous segment, but it seems like you've got a stronger opinion on it. Game 269-270, Carolina and San Francisco. 49ers a a five-and-a-half point favorite at home here. You're kind of interested in the dog. I am, and and, and I'll preface this by saying I'm a believer in the 49ers. I, uh, I took them in the props to make the playoffs. I took them on season wins. Uh, so, so this was a, this is a team I really do like and especially like their defense and, and I'm not against them because of that performance necessarily last week in Washington, uh, even though they didn't cover, they did shut them out because if you watch that game, you know, that the, the weather was bad, a lot of rain and wind, sloppy field. So that's a game almost that you can kind of throw out a little bit in terms of evaluating the team, I think, going forward. Even though that was a little bit of a tricky spot, having to go all the way across the country after getting that big divisional road win at the Rams in in L.A. the week before. But I wonder, too, now the 49ers are 6-0. and I mean, how many undefeated teams do we have in the National Football League? We have two. We have the San Francisco 49ers, and we have the clearly the New England Patriots, who we saw lay weight waste to the Jets on Monday night. But how do the 49ers now, a team that hasn't been used to success and hasn't been used to all this publicity and all the love from the national media that are really finally taking notice, how do they handle that going forward? And, and I think that that's an interesting spot. You get a Carolina team off a bye that, uh, that, that did go to London and get a win. And look, all of a sudden, Carolina, they are, uh, I mean, they're, they're doing well under Kyle Allen. And, and you got to think at some point, you know, Cam would get his starting uh, job back when he's coming back. But uh, you got to ride the hot hand. And this team just looks like it has a lot more life with Kyle Allen at quarterback, I think Christian McCaffrey is playing better. And I think that inspires the whole team and that inspires the defense to play really well. And I also wonder if, uh, if you're finally going to see, because San Francisco last week uh, against, uh, against the Washington team, that's all kind of banged up, but they have one of the longer injury uh, reports in, in the league. Now you have the 49ers who, by the way, are still missing their two starting tackles. Still missing Joe Staley. Still missing the draft pick Mike McGlinchey uh, out of Notre Dame. So this is a team that's got some really key injuries. And also Jusick, a fullback, even though uh, a fullback seems to have gone the way of like the Model T and the Edsel in in the NFL, the 49ers actually still use it uh, very, very much, and, and especially in their running game from a blocking, uh, short running game, short passing game, and Jusic is still out. So maybe the 49ers injuries kind of show a little bit here in this game. And uh, I know it's five and a half. There might still be a rogue six out there. Uh, I th- I just thought when this line came out uh, that, that, this, that this was way too high. Yeah, I think so, too. I may end up on Carolina here in a contest context this week. And, you know, look, I mean, not just Carolina coming off the bye, but most importantly, Christian McCaffrey coming off the bye. This is a guy with such a heavy workload. The week off had to be a godsend for him. I know that he missed some practices here recently, I believe, with a back injury, stuff like that. That bye should really help him. And also the best way to to slow down a pass rush is to have a guy like Christian McCaffrey. You can hand him the football. You can throw him the swing passes. He can go out and catch balls in the flat. He can do a lot of different things, line up in the slot. That's probably going to slow down that San Francisco pass rush a little bit, just being worried about him having extra defenders following along with him. So I think schematically that's something that works in Carolina's favor. And also, too, look, the weather was really bad, and I get that. But also this San Francisco offense, I mean, they're 15th in the league in yards per play with 5.7. 
they're not an elite offense. The defense is very, very good. The offense is pretty good. And like you said, they've got three key injuries, you know, with the offensive line, with the two tackles, the fullbacks out. You know, that's a position that Kyle Shanahan loves to use in a variety of different ways. So I think a lot of things do set up in Carolina's favor here. Yeah, long trip. Yeah, they played a lot of road games, but they did have the bye last week, and a bye can only help Christian McCaffrey. So I like Carolina here, too. I think you're on the right track there with that one. One that's interesting to me that you sent over here, the New York Giants taking on the Detroit Lions in the first game on the board for Sunday, 251-252. After the performance the Giants put together last week, how can you possibly back them? Yeah, and, and I mean, it is another hold-your-nose play, but uh, I look at Detroit, and and I know they were competitive in the game for a while until it kind of got away at the end, but I thought that there was a little bit of hangover for the Detroit Lions. After they lost that game in Green Bay where, you know, quite frankly, they really got jobbed. They probably should have won the game, and I mean, it's not like the Lions were great in the game, but I think Green Bay was a little bit worse. And we know the calls kind of near the end of the game. They, the, the Lions really got a bad whistle and then had to go back home dealing with a game that they lost that they really should have won. And then I think now you're starting to see, I think the hangover still might be there. Uh, the uh, the Lions made a trade yesterday, trading uh, – Contre Diggs, uh, I, I forget the name of the team, but I saw on the wire because there's some like minor trades getting made, of course, with uh, Sanu going to the Patriots, another one from yesterday. But you're starting to see some of these uh, these trades in the NFL. And the guy Diggs out of the Lions secondary, one of their starters got traded for a late round pick. And then seeing Darius Slay, who's kind of the leader of the defense, the captain of the defense, the guy that's been there a while, uh, does the little uh, quote retweet and then has a WTF is what his tweet was with the with the face palm about how they're 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 trading uh, one of their guys digs. And maybe and I don't want to overread into that, but maybe that's saying something. I mean, maybe that's saying that there's some things now going on there in Detroit that 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 we're not seeing and the fact that they're that they're making these trades uh i mean he digs was a guy that was hurt and then i believe they got him back and now they trade him and uh and i think also one of the things you're seeing with the giants is they're probably and they're not great they're probably as healthy as they've been all season look saquon that was his first game back against arizona so he needed a game under his belt. They got him back. They're getting Gallman back. They uh, have been Ingram back. So this team has been all kind of banged up. And last week was really their first game. And, and, and look, the Giants were the number one team in, I believe, the Super Contest. I know they were in the Super Contest. And I believe they were in the Circa. If they weren't number one, they were number two in the Circa Sports Million. So... Everybody was on the Giants in these contests, and a lot of people played them because they went through the three, the key number, to three and a half, and and then they don't get there. So sometimes when that happens and you have so many people on, on a team and they don't get there, and then obviously you're going to be gun-shy and skittish to back them the next week. So a team doesn't get there for us and they're dead to us, and then we, we throw them away a little bit. And maybe that's the time that you want to you want to try to back that team when all of a sudden everybody that loved them the week before absolutely hates them. So, yeah, I thought this was an interesting spot for, for the Giants here against a Detroit team that uh, I think is uh, going through some things right now. All right, let's move over to the college side of things here for a couple of minutes. And, and let's take a look here at game 117, 118. Memphis and Tulsa and I thought that it was interesting that you had this game at the top of the list probably not a game that's going to get a ton of run out there here this week especially with some really marquee games but you know a lot of times we talk about this in college basketball especially those off the radar types of games usually the best ones to bet because they're going to have you know the most opportunity to get some line value maybe be an overlooked game much like this one is why Tulsa for you this week yeah, this was uh this was an interesting one that did come up and uh 
Look, uh, Memphis got baited last week. Uh, they, of course, had that tough loss at Temple uh, where they had the ball at the end but couldn't convert, and uh, they lose outright at Temple. And then they get Tulane last week. And uh, Tulane, actually, I think the line, if I recall, opened maybe four, four and a half. That's what it was for a decent amount of the week. That got as low on Saturday as one and a half where Memphis was laying uh, points to Tulane, and they end up winning by 30 points, 47 to 17. Now they're going to a Tulsa team that's two and five. That uh, The Tulsa, I mean, they haven't been winning games, Tulsa, but they've been in some tough scheduling spots. And, uh, like, they're one of those teams that I think are better than their record. You've seen little improvements. The quarterback play is better with Zach Smith, the uh, – the Baylor transfer, but it's just not translating to wins and losses uh, this year. They went to Cincinnati and covered uh, really we're in, we're in at the whole game. They lost uh, 24 to 13 because I think uh, going back to Tulsa and you go back to the start of the month when they were, uh, they were two and two, their two losses were to Michigan state and Oklahoma state who were both at one point ranked in the top 25. No shame in that. Then they go to SMU and they get that big 30 to 9 lead and end up losing in triple overtime. So then the next week they were totally hung over from that spot against uh, Navy and Navy and Navy ran them out uh, in their own place. And then they went to Cincinnati and did cover last week. Well now you got a Tulsa team that is improved but yet only 2 and 5. So this is the game where they have to have their maximum effort because they have five games left on this schedule, and they've got and they've got to uh, win four of them to get bowl eligible. You would think the last game, uh, two games of the season they'd be favored over Houston and probably even favored in East Carolina. But now you've got this game. You've got Memphis. Then you got to go to Tulane, and then you got UCF at home. So you got to beat two of these three good teams. Uh, and uh, I, I just think that. This is probably the game where you're going to get their maximum effort because the backs are kind of against the wall here for, for, for a Tulsa team at home uh, playing Memphis. And, I mean, if you look at that schedule that I read for Tulsa, that's a tough schedule coming down the stretch. And I think that shows that this American Athletic Conference is really good this year. And, and you don't really get a lot of off weeks. And, and, and you would think you would in this non-Power 5, but – just evaluating the schedule, this is their, this conference is better than the ACC this year. Putting Clemson aside, and and uh, and I think with uh, with with Memphis here, this is kind of a little bit of that sandwich spot as well because all of a sudden Memphis is going to who was the favorite in the West in the American Athletic Conference. They got SMU coming in, and SMU is the two touchdown favorite Thursday night is likely to be undefeated. So they're getting a big game with SMU the first week of weekend of November. So this is kind of a little bit of a tricky spot for Memphis. And I think getting uh, 10 in the hook, uh, Tulsa is going to be live here. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I think you're on the right track with that one. And, and you know, these spot plays are going to be very important here over the rest of the season because you get these big games with division implications, conference implications. You, know, you want to get to that conference title game get to as good of a bowl game as you can get to you know in some of these conferences maybe that's the difference between going to the bahamas and going to birmingham or something right. like that so you know those are some considerations to have here especially once we get into november uh you know in college football but one other college football game i want to touch on with you and uh i guess the theme of your week is is trying to find opportunities to bet on teams that nobody wants to bet on miami florida going up to pit game 189 190 uh, Pitt should have won that Syracuse game by a lot more than they did. Let Syracuse hang around, gave up the 94-yard touchdown reception. I was able to sweat Pitt big time in that game. But Miami goes on the road to Pitt here for an early kickoff in the Steel City, and you're actually interested in the six-point dog here. Yeah, uh, uh, much to my chagrin almost, to be honest with you. I, I did bet Georgia Tech uh, just thinking they can hang in the number with with a, a Miami team that was off a really big win last week, uh, and, and and sure enough, Miami gets beat out right at home. They have, uh, I believe, uh, I believe they had three missed field goals uh, in the fourth quarter, including one that got blocked a chip shot late, and then uh, 
Miami loses in overtime as uh, Brevin Jordan gets Mark short and sticks. It looks like they were going to get first and goal inside the 10 yard line and, and they get stopped and they actually lose a review. So Georgia tech, all of a sudden has got a little bit of an anticlimactic ending for them. Georgia tech uh, gets the win out right in overtime. And it, it really, with this ACC, especially this coastal division, if you remember the, the segment that they used to have on the, the recap, show after all the college football games were done on Saturday they would have this running bit called the ACC wheel of destiny well really with Clemson dominating the Atlantic division it's really the ACC coastal division wheel of destiny because when you think a team is out of it they win and these teams just all beat each other and they're all separated by by two games Miami and Georgia Tech uh and Georgia Tech is the rightful bottom feeder in the division, even though they did get a win on the road in Miami. We know they're a rebuilding team with a new offense and needing to get personnel geared toward that new offense. I mean, that rebuild is going to take a little while down in Atlanta. But with uh, Miami, look, their defense is, is still pretty darn solid. And, and, and they beat Virginia, who really probably – if you were to pinpoint a team who might be the best or at least most consistent team in that ACC coastal, it'd be Virginia. So, uh, uh, and Virginia is kind of up there at the top with Pittsburgh chasing them a little bit, but all of these teams, you throw them all together, Virginia tech, uh, uh, North Carolina, uh, Pitt, Duke, all these teams in the coastal, it's like you could kind of throw a blanket over them and they, and they're, and they're going to beat each other. And one week they're going to look poor, and then the next week they're going to look great. You saw that with Virginia. They absolutely – they were only laying like three and a half to Duke, and Duke was even taking a little money, and they absolutely destroyed Duke. So I almost think it, it's the way is to kind of go the unconventional way and to go with the team that, that nobody wants, and, and that's what you're finding in this division. And Miami also getting Jeff Thomas back from a suspension, their receiver. I think that's going to help. We'll see who the starting quarterback is going to be or, or if they stick with him, Tozy Perry. Because, look, that's what happened with Miami last year when Mark Rick was still there. They went musical chairs with quarterback. They played Malik Rozier. Then they put in Tozy Perry. And then Perry struggled in a start on the road. And then they went back to Malik Rozier. And then they went back to Tozy Perry. So, We'll see who they're going to stick with here. I mean, the one concern for Miami is they don't protect the quarterback that well, and Pittsburgh does get after the passer. I know you were referencing that game on Friday at Syracuse. They got all after Tommy DeVito, and eventually he got knocked from the game, and they had to go with the the kid Welch, who gave them a little bit of life in Syracuse just because he was a little bit more of a run-pass option necessarily than DeVito was. So – that's the concern, but boy, it looks like a, it looks like an ugly dog, but it looks like one that might get there. And look, Pitt uh, has has been on the road for a couple games. Uh, they had the road game at Duke, and then they had the bye week, and then they had the game at Syracuse. Last time out at home, they got taken to the limit by Delaware, for, uh, FCS Delaware, uh, an OK program, and and barely got out of there. So. They hadn't been home in a while, so maybe they're going to be really excited and fired up. But this just looks like a spot where you might catch the Panthers flat. All right, so let's talk a little bit of golf here. Just real quickly, this is a new event over on the Asian Swing in Japan, the Zozo Championship. What do you do here with a new event? I mean, obviously no course form data, so I guess you're just looking at recent form. But we got some guys, Andrew Shoffley, Tiger Woods types, coming off the shelf, haven't played in a little while, or maybe have played an event here or there. I know Tugger played the skins thing earlier on in the week. What, what do you do with a tournament like this? Yeah, I think what you're looking at, I mean, you are looking at a little bit of recent form. You're also looking at uh, maybe some past, uh, I guess if you want to call it past Asian form, uh, guys that have played well over there. Because this event, the Zozo Championship in Japan, essentially – replaces what was known as the CIMB Classic, which they used to play in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. So kind of looking at the form from there, looking a little bit of what you saw last week in South Korea. So that's a little bit what I did. And I guess uh, 
and and I hated to have an obvious play, but I just thought it was a fair number with uh, Justin Thomas and Roy McElroy both being the favorites in the field. And I did take a shot with uh, with Matsuyami. He was my shortest price at eighteen to one. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of pressure on him to win the actual first PGA Tour sanctioned event in Japan, which this Zozo Championship is. But I liked his form. He was a, a solid tied for third last week at South Korea. So he was a guy I looked at. Gary Woodland is also one of those uh, sneaky guys who really has taken a liking to Asia in recent years. And he's around 30 to 1. Uh, three top fives at the former CIMB Classic in Malaysia, plus a second and third the last two years at the CJ Cup at Nine Bridges over in Juju Island, South Korea. Also go back to 2011. He's won over here before it was a team event, the World Cup of Golf in uh, China when he was teaming with Matt Kuchar. So he's a guy that likes the Asian swing. Uh, also went with uh, with uh, Benny An at 45 to 1, a South Korean who really likes these tree line layouts. Uh, go back to how well he played at the uh, at the Wyndham and at the Sanderson Farms kind of here recently in the fall. And he likes these layouts. Uh, Longer shots, I, I went just on kind of stat plays. And these are two 80 to 1 guys. Uh, Corey Connors, who is first in the PGA Tour in strokes gained off the tee. And I think you are going to have to be good off the tee this week because you've got a really weird setup here in terms of the fact that you have two tiered greens, that you almost have like two separate greens on all of these courses, which I guess is a pretty widespread, all considering in Japanese on Japanese golf courses. So if you hit the wrong green, you actually get to take a drop for the for the for the nearest relief. So that's going to make scrambling a little interesting and I think very important. And that's what led me to Jason Kokrak, who uh, ranks number one on the PGA Tour in scrambling. And uh, so so I went with those guys at 80 to one. And, then, and I think because you don't have a lot of form uh, or really no form in terms of course form here you can maybe get some guys a little bit down the radar we kind of saw it at, at the cj cup last week even though justin thomas was the chalk and won at seven to one who was right there with him down the stretch was danny lee who was a 200 to one shot so you will get some people in the final round that are on this leaderboard that you're not going to expect that are going to be bombs Wes Reynolds, who's working, you can find on Twitter at Wes Reynolds and the number one. And also, as I mentioned at the top of the segment here, you can find him on VEASAN. And in fact, you can find him a lot on VEASAN here this week. Yeah, uh, starting tonight, this is usually one of my nights off. Uh, we'll be on 6 to 10 on the Green Zone. That's 6 uh, p.m. to 10 p.m. Pacific uh, with myself and Brady Cannon. So, look. The, even though opening night was last night, the first full board of real opening night NBA tonight, and then also the World Series game two as uh, Houston tries to uh, tie that up against the Washington Nationals. So at, at least we've got something going on during the show. And then, of course, we'll be previewing NFL games and the college football card for the weekend. So uh, Wednesday night tonight, also Thursday night, uh, myself, Lamal Shah, Brady Cannon, 6 to 10. On uh, Thursday, same on Friday, and then the weekend shows, we go 2 to 6 Pacific uh, for the uh, college football, and then 3 to 7 Pacific uh, for NFL Sunday. We're usually kind of in the middle of the uh, late game window and then kind of into the Sunday night game. So a lot of stuff going on the next few days. Well, like I said, make sure you follow West on Twitter at West Reynolds and the number one and check him out on VEASAN and also in that point spread weekly newsletter. Wes, always a pleasure, man. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. We'll talk to you again next week. Adam, take care, partner.